5.05 p.m. Uh, can you click the uh, next thing on our agenda there? The language right. Uh, we have first item on the list here is a public hearing. Um, I want to call this public hearing to order at 5.06 p.m. This is on the issue of uh, the California Voting Rights Act and transition to uh, by district trustee elections. Great. Uh, thank you, President Howard. Tonight we have uh, Liz uh, Stitt uh, joining us from Redistricting Partners, um, our consultant firm that we hired to help us through this process. I'll turn over the mic to you, Liz. Thank you. Right. Okay, so I have a presentation that I'm going to share. Let me just pull it up. Here we go. Um, so as Dan said, my name is Liz Stitt with Redistricting Partners. Last time you saw Paul, you'll be saying both of us uh, interchangeably. Um, today, I'm going to focus more on the public outreach side, but it's going to look very similar to what you saw last time. This is the second uh, meeting of five. Um, so that means next time you'll be receiving maps. Um, so on the agenda, like last time, very similar. We're gonna go over what districting is, the traditional districting principles with an emphasis on communities of interest. We'll get into districter, um, which is all set up and I'll show you what that is. Um, and then we'll talk about the population and the hearing schedule. Um, so I'll go through this quickly because you went through it last time. Um, what is districting? It's essentially just putting together um, the uh, initial election district boundaries. So it essentially does two things, who's eligible to run for office and who can vote in those elections. What it doesn't do, um, it doesn't impact uh, really anything other than the elections. So it doesn't impact the services that people receive and it doesn't impact your culture as a board. Um, so you'll still be able to work together uh, on projects. It doesn't have to be uh, put in buckets for each area. So these are the required redistricting um, criteria. Uh, this is for the, this is under the Fair Maps Act. It really applies to cities and counties, but we do advise special districts and school districts to use uh, these ranked criteria as well. So on the first uh, set of criteria, it is each trustee area should be relatively equal in size. So it's gotta be under a 10% total deviation. Um, and that essentially ensures that people have the ability to equally advocate for themselves no matter where they live. Uh, and it's based on people. So we're talking about total population and not just voters and not just citizens, but everyone who lives in that community. Then we have to make sure trustee areas are contiguous. That essentially just means that it's one whole piece. We can draw it with one line. Uh, there are two different ways of thinking about contiguity. So there's literal contiguity and functional contiguity, literal is what you would think. If you look at a map and it's one whole piece, that would be considered literal. But if you look at the map and there's a mountain in between and it's preventing people from being able to go from one part of the trusting area to another, that would be considered not functionally contiguous. So people should be able to travel through it. Hmm. These are some examples of, well, this one is not contiguous, you can see, but the purple at the top of the screen is not connected to the rest of uh, the D uh, area. So that would be considered not contiguous. And this is an example of travel contiguity. So that line right there, uh, the highlighted one, that is a uh, railroad track that actually splits the city, uh, that is the city of Davis. There's only three thoroughfares through there, so it was used as a natural boundary. We And I'll get to maintain communities of interest in a moment. I'm going to spend more time on that one, um, but we also want to make sure each line is easy to identify uh, and using those natural boundaries, either man-made or natural, um, 
like the uh, railroad to uh, divide and use as lines. And then keeping districts compact. So essentially that's just making sure we're not uh, using funny looking shapes that people associate with gerrymandering. So we're avoiding ribbons and lines and we're using circles and squares and compactness. And this is an example we like to share on um, what is an example of what's not compact and what is. So you can see the um, city on the left, same city, but the photo on the left, it's all ribbony and snaking up and down. It's cutting through communities. And the point really is to keep communities together so they have a stronger voting power. When you divide them, you're dividing their ability to advocate for themselves as a community. So why is this important? Uh, maintaining communities of interest uh, is ranked pretty high in the criteria. Um, and that is, as I was mentioning, because uh, it allows people to advocate for themselves. So in terms of you being a board, when you hear people testifying, these are the things that you're gonna be looking for. Um, so what, group are they with? What shared characteristics or bond do they have? Um, can we map their community? That's probably the most important aspect. Um, remember, we want to make sure that their community that lives together, if they're a community of, for example, left-handed people, they're going to be district, and Paul probably used that last time, didn't he? <laughs> uh, they're going to be district-wide, right? So they need to be living together. Um, and then what's the relationship to the school board? Um, how are they impacted? Um, when we help cities redistrict, probably the most common uh, comment we get is, well, how does this impact school districts? And uh, so we get a lot of comments from school districts, but when it comes to city redistricting, that's not relevant. So really we're looking for the relevancy and how people are impacted um, by this. We like to think of uh, communities of interest as building blocks for districts. Um, and the Voting Rights Act does cover some uh, communities. Um, so Latinos, Asians, African-Americans are the three most common voting rights um, communities in California. But importantly, unless there is a section two non-compliance issue, uh, we can't use race as the predominant factor. So it can definitely be discussed, and it often is, um, but it can't be the driving factor. Um, I like to show this slide to show how diverse communities of interest is. So it goes well beyond neighborhoods. It also includes things, well, school districts is on here, but um, so downtown areas, um, rural areas, uh, homeowners and renters are a very common um, occurrence. Um, so I usually like to say, if you can make the argument that you're a community of interest, you probably are, um, unless you're one of these three things. Um, so under the Fair Maps Act, it explicitly prohibits these three groups from being considered a community of interest. Um, so political party affiliation, incumbents, and political candidates. Um, and then the next part, uh, not prohibited, it's just really hard to draw. So groups of similarly minded people, uh, just that noise to like takes me back to, <laughs> takes me back. Um, so groups of similarly minded people who don't share a similar geographic location, um, remembering we need to be able to draw them and map them. Um, so if we can't map them, um, then, uh, you know, they're, that would be impossible to draw, basically. Um, and then in communities of interest that are district-wide. So remembering that we're trying to protect their voice at the, you know, voting box. Um, and if they are district wide, um, then again, that would be really difficult to draw. So when people testify to the board um, about districting, we like to ask them these three questions, sort of prime them before they testify. So does the community have a shared culture, characteristic, or bond? Can the community be 
geographic community met? And then how would they describe their relationship with the, uh, with the board? So um, the school district decided to go with using an online mapping tool um, for community members to use. This is incredibly useful. The cities of Belmont and Redwood City both use Districtor. Um, it's a uh, website that was created by researchers at Tufts University to get people, everyday people involved in their local redistrictings. Um, and I'll show you how to use it at the end of this presentation. Um, it's incredibly intuitive and uh, I'm going through this kind of quickly tonight because I know you have a long agenda, but we will be having a July meeting directly uh, for the public. So they'll be able to come learn about the districting process and learn how to use Districtor uh, and we'll be able to take questions from the public at that time as well. Um, so we'll be sending out um, the dates uh, soon. And, and I should mention uh, the July meeting will be a community engagement meeting. It won't be a formalized board meeting. Mm. Yeah, I'll work with um, our partners and to, to schedule that. Okay. Um, so as Paula went over last time, this is the, obviously the district um, that your total population is almost 45,000 people. Um, if we divide that by five, it's going to be about 8,000 and some change um, per trustee area. Um, and then we, when you get maps from us, uh, it's always going to be broken down into census data and citizen voting age population data. And those two data sets are used for different aspects of districting, um, but both very important. So the census data is used to ensure we're drawing equally, you know, relatively equally balanced areas. And then citizen voting age population is there to make sure that we're following the Voting Rights Act requirements. And then here's another slide on the uh, population. And then here is the, um, the agenda, or rather the schedule for this districting. Um, Obviously, in July, we'll have that those dates soon, um, but we'll come back perhaps, after hearing uh, comments from the public. We'll have at least three maps for you in September, um, and then October, we'll come back after you give us your feedback and hear feedback from the public um, with another set of revised maps, um, and then November, you will uh, hopefully make your final decision. So that is the presentation. I'm happy to take questions or go directly into Districtor. Well, we have a process. Uh, so um, the first piece is Ms. Ellinger, do we have any requests for public comment on this matter? No, we don't. Okay, um, uh, since seeing that there are no public comments, the board will close uh, the public hearing at 5, 19 p.m. And now we can open up the board discussion. Yes. Can you um, clarify again the, the terminology, um, is either the majority, minority, or minority of the majority or something like that I, in terms of districting? So um, I'm assuming you're referring to the Voting Rights Act uh, aspect of Majority minority yes. areas. Yes. So how do you you say majority of minority areas? But major minor majority minority area. Yes. Okay. Yes. So it's a majority of a group um, such as African Americans, Latinos. These are protected classes under the um, Voting Rights Act. Mm -hmm. um, so essentially, if there are um, cities, you know, jurisdictions where you can draw a, um, you know, for example, trustee area. The, if there's a population the size of a trustee area and there's a majority of that protected class, mm -hmm. then we might be required to ensure that that protected class is kept together during the districting. Got it. Um, and that's been the law of the land since what, 1965, so 1970 would have been the first time 
redistricting had to use that. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, this is maybe basic when you say <laughs> uh, when you say uh, if you can map it, are you mapping just from voter data, census data? Like what are you using to map? Yeah, and I can show you on district or two because a lot of it's the same data, but yep. you will you'll be able to see. So not only are you getting the census data, uh, but you're also getting the American Community Survey data. So you'll be able to break down the populations by voting age and by total population. Um, and you can really nerd out with all the... <laughs> that would never happen here. <laughs> um, and with the, there was a slide with numbers as far as like kind of divided by, by identity. Is this multiracial, do they get to claim both identities or no identity? Like, are they just an other? Or are they like double dipped in the numbers? Yeah, yeah, the, so the census, isn't um very nuanced yeah. um still and, and in many ways they're not catching up with how you know people are talking about race these days so usually when we're judging what a majority minority district is for example we're using the citizen voting age population um of a race um so what they claim on their census forms right. um and if they're claiming, you know, multiple races, right. then that's not considered, you know, they wouldn't be considered Asian if they're like claiming white right. and so they're not counted twice, they would just be in other. Okay. Or they'd be one of the whichever yeah. the highest one alphabetically. A like a category. There's there's a category for um like you know, half right. whatever. Yeah. Um, and that's not included in um like uh, African American alone, so there would be categories that break down each um, racial group um, and what they claimed on their census forms. I don't know. <laughs> so, okay. so <laughs> I feel like I need like a whiteboard to. Explain. When I see the number four hundred nine mm -hmm. for black, those are four hundred nine people who are all, both parents are black. Yes. And then yes. somebody who is black and Asian is is in yeah. other or they like where are they counted? They're they're not counted as oh in in terms of the data that we're giving yes. you yes that would be considered other okay yeah okay. sorry I'm thinking of what I'm looking at on my screen when I'm drawing but yes, yeah when you get it you will be seeing uh, that in like in the category of other. Any other questions or comments? Seeing as there are none, uh, thank you very much. And we'll be moving on she, to the next. He was going to give us a demonstration of what? Oh, a, a brief overview of Districtor. Okay. Uh, it's ready to go. go She'll crazy. give us a, a, a little tour of that. I got things to do. <laughs> <laughs> Tight schedule here. Okay. So if you go to districtor.org slash tag slash BRSFD, um, that takes you to your landing page for Districtor. This is created specifically for the school district. Um, there's a how-to section, um, but hopefully folks will be coming to our um, outreach meeting where we'll be able to get more in-depth on how they can draw maps. They'll have the option of drawing two different types of maps. So um, community maps are the COI, so community of interest maps. Um, they can draw, uh, this is helpful for us to know where their communities are so we don't split it up during the districting. Um, it's just another tool that we'll have in terms of public testimony. So this is what it looks like. Um, there are four different buttons up here. So this hand moves the map around this is the brush so literally that's what you would use to draw your community this is the eraser um does exactly what you think it erases if you did too much of it um magnifying glass just allows you to see more of the population and essentially what the demographics are like in that population 
So going back to the draw or brush, um, you'll see that people can describe their community. So they would name it and then describe how their community, um, essentially those three questions that we asked. So um, what are their shared characteristic or bond? You know, they're mapping it. Um, and then how is it impacted by the school district? And then they can draw as many as they want as well. So up here, you can add, I mean, as many as you want. People always ask if there's a limit and it's really only limited by your own sanity. <laughs> so the other button that I just clicked allows you to draw actual trustee areas and you can draw trustee areas that are balanced and could be used as a map um, for the district. So um, when you go here and press the brush, it gives you five different um, colors representing the different seats. Uh, so let me adjust the size. You can adjust the brush size to make it larger. And you can see the population is populating. And it tells you the ideal size and how far away from the ideal population. Remember, the total deviation needs to be under 10%. Unfortunately, this only tells us what the maximum population. So with this, we want to make sure everything's under 5%. So it only tells us like half of the story. So as long as it's under 5%, it's going to be an evenly drawn map. In terms of the data layers, we did add the neighborhood. So people have the ability to use that as a way to construct their districts. That's cool. Um, when you zoom in, it actually does, it gets, uh, obviously, you can see the street names uh, and, um, you know, uh, areas of interest as well. Let me get rid of that. And then the demographics. So it breaks it up by population, by race. And then it also breaks it up, let's see. So total population and citizen voting age population. I love that Belmont Hill is not actually part of Belmont. Hmm. <laughs> what about um, culture? Like, I don't know, Muslim, Jewish. I, I didn't see the other one of the communities of interest. It's really by the census data, which is population by race. So how would you how would you fill that one out if that was a, con a community of interest to somebody? So in terms of community of interest, um, religious groups are considered a community of interest, um, but not necessarily protected under the Voting Rights Act. So um, it is something that we would want to take into account uh, to make sure we're not splitting communities. Um, but religion doesn't necessarily mean um, equal to race, right? Um, so it's it's similar, but not the same. But I mean, what I'm saying is like, let's say that somebody just wanted to mention that uh, and, and they're drawing, how would, like there was a drop down which was very helpful. How would that, if that was a, a major thing for them, how would they yeah. be able to like even know the data for it? So in terms of, uh, let's say there's like a synagogue um, and that's, uh, somebody's community, they would want to use the other mapping tool, so the community of interest tool, and then um, pinpoint on the map um, where their synagogue is, why it's important to okay. keep the community together. They would need to know, they would just uh, guesstimate that, that the synagogue was on that street or that zone, and then just color code it appropriately. Yeah, and they should be able to see it. You should usually the map does pinpoint. Okay. Look. Usually the map does point out uh, like churches and stuff like that. Let's see if we can spot any. Mm -hmm. Obviously, this one's this one has color in it because we're not you know drawing five different trusty areas. Yeah, like there's a church off of Ralston, isn't there? Is there a Greek church or something? Oh yeah. Oh, there you go. Like here's one. So if I went to that church as part of my community, um, I would go to important places mm -hmm. and just click on that. Mm -hmm. 
So now it's a pinpoint and describe, you know, like place of worship and describe that community. And then along with that, if it's in my neighborhood, I would say like, this is, uh, this is my community, right? So everyone um, goes to this church. Mm -hmm. And then I would describe it and then submit it. It's unfortunate it doesn't give you the, the, the total number of just eligible voters in there like the other one did. So you could see like, you know. So it does, it does do that. And this one it does? Oh, so same, we have the same data layers. Okay, good. We can break it down by population. Um, and we can evaluate as well. Voting age. So voting age, again, is what we use to make sure we're in compliance with the Voting Rights Act. Total population um, is to see how the um, trustee areas are composed. So is, is it fair to say that the uh, communities of interest, that second tab, is, is kind of a communication metric for the community to say, hey, we want you to consider this group or think through this when you're doing the next stage, which is the five um, voting, the larger, the, the other block? Yes, yeah. yes. So when people are being... Are, being asked to testify about their communities, we really want to know why um, why they shouldn't be split up. So people who testify need to um, let us know exactly that reason. So um, not splitting them up is important to make <laughs> the ability to um, you know vote in a cohesive block. Um, when it comes to drawing the other option, then they'll be able to draw a map looking district wide on what they think is a fair assessment of a districted board. I have a question about uh, what demographics you can tell for census block. I see you have um, races, one of them. What other, like religion? I mean, does it say this block has a certain... Funny or any other it demographics? Break it down by religion. And I'm assuming mostly because the Voting Rights Act um, is so important here, where it focuses mostly on race and not so much on religion. Uh, are there any other demographics that it shows other than race? So, not on Districtor. Um, if you want us to bring you back more data sets, something that we often do um, is we'll break down districts by. Um, where the majority of renters are, mm, that's renters, a what the income levels are like, um, what the age levels are like. Yeah. So um, if that is something that you want us to create for you, we're happy to do that. Um, yeah, especially that's really the economic status. Yes, is important. That, that's a uh, very commonly mean or reality, right? for, and we can get you like a, a heat map of that. Mm -hmm. Perfect. Any more questions or comments? Any more demos? <laughs> well done. Yes. And I see this is live right now, um, so anyone can access it. And I'm yes. assuming we'll get it linked up on our district website soon. Okay, great. Um, I, I believe, President Howard, there's interest um, expressed to me about forming a board a subcommittee to interface with redistricting partners um, as needed mm -hmm. uh, throughout the process if that interests the board. Sure. Does it interest the board? Sure. I'd be interested in that. Okay. Yeah. Uh, wanted uh, persons of interest then submit their name to Dan and then just figure out who, who that can be. Or okay. that can have up to two. Okay. Great. Right. Thank you. Great. Okay. <laughs> oh, well, yeah, one final thing is um, July meeting. So we'll be, um, that is something, it will be, like town hall style, I guess. Yeah, um, actually, this one works better to do virtually. Oh, don't uh, virtually. Because they can actually see the movement of the cursor and the mouse in the mm. trustee areas better. And it also allows us to video and send out again as well. Okay, great. Thank you, Liz. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Thanks for joining us.
Moving on to our next subject. I could switch the plaques. Moving on to our next subject. <laughs> okay. Um, public uh, comments on uh, closed session items. Are there any uh, requests for public comment on closed session items? No, there are not. Seeing as there are not none, we're going to convene to closed session at 5.35 p.m. Where are we doing that? We're on the corner. We're right on the staff.
Oh. Progress. Wow. Can't see the way. <laughs> <laughs> All right. I'm seeing it on YouTube. Okay, uh, so uh, I now uh, reconvene to open session at 6.24 p.m. Sorry for the delay. Uh, first order of business is flag salutes. Allegiance to the flag of the United States, States of America, America. to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, the and justice for all. Thank you, everyone. Uh, I have one announcement to report from closed. Um, the report out from our June 15 closed session 2023 is the board has voted 420 with one trustee in an absentia to provide the superintendent with a satisfactory evaluation. Where to be satisfactory. <laughs> for the superintendent's contract, he shall receive a 2.5% base salary increase for the 2023 to 24 school year, commence on July 1st, 2023. Um, speakers wishing to address the board. Uh, that is our next agenda item. Um, to submit a question or uh, comment on a regular session item, please fill out or uh, please submit a speaker card by the start of the agenda item. During the meeting, speakers will be called upon to make their comment. If you are addressing the board on a non agenda item, please be aware of the Provisions of the Brown Act prohibit the board from acting on or discussing such matters at this meeting. Public comments are limited to three minutes per person per topic. So if you have three minutes that you want to spend on a topic, you can read the Star Spangled Banner three minutes in a row, uh, but you cannot read any more um, comments on that particular item. Uh, Ms. Ellinger, do we have any speakers on agenda or non-agenda item? Yes, we have Erica Liang. Speaking on middle school interdistrict transfer. I felt disappointing, like I should you know, start. <laughs> That's a three minute filibuster. I know. All right. Um, thank you for allowing me to speak today. My name is Erica Chulang, and I'm the mother of three girls. Um, I have a kindergartner and a second grader at Fox, um, which is in our neighborhood. We live in the Hallmark area and have been loyal taxpayers and living there for 15 years. I'm here to explain our extenuating circumstances that I'm hoping will allow us an intra-district transfer for my oldest daughter, Kira, who has been assigned to Nesbitt Middle School and our, and our closest middle school, Ralston, which is only half a mile away from our house. I work as an emergency medicine doctor and first responder at Peninsula Hospital in Burlingame, which serves the patients and families in our county of San Mateo. I've been there for the last seven years and in the last two years have shifted to all night shifts specifically to allow me to spend time with my school-aged daughters as they grow up. My shift schedule is erratic, and I often stay many hours after the scheduled end of my shift to help with continued patient care and stabilization of life-threatening conditions. This makes it impossible for me to help my husband, who also works a full-time job with morning drop-offs, especially if located at two different schools, one of which is located four miles away from our home. We chose our neighborhood due to the proximity of both Fox Elementary and Ralston Middle School, which are within walking distance from our house. Our eldest daughter, who will start sixth grade in the fall, was assigned Nesbitt, 
which will be near impossible to get to during morning rush hour, especially given the identical start times to our younger daughter's elementary at Fox. Um, our closest bus stop is 1.5 miles away, which will require her to arrive at school 45 minutes prior to the start time and also cross multiple busy intersections, including El Camino Real without crossing guards, which is not safe. To me, this seems like an unnecessary risk to take for an 11 year old girl when there's a closer middle school option less than a mile from our home. We have entered the intrinsic transfer process. However, we understand this is a lottery system. I'm hoping that our extenuating circumstances can be taken into account in reassigning her to Ralston, which is our closest middle school and located in our community. Um, I'm also aware that intra-district transfers cannot occur if there are no spots available. With school out for the summer and lots of families on vacation and middle school assignments may be the first thing from people's minds. However, I'm hoping that families whose circumstances have changed and whose children are not planning to attend their assigned middle school will be reminded by the district to notify BRSSD as soon as they can so that these spots can be reassigned to those children who need them. I would appreciate any special consideration that may be afforded our situation as it would be difficult for me on a busy stressful shift in the ER to also worry about the safety of my child commuting to and from middle school from our home. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you. Ms. Ellinger, are there any more speakers looking to address the board? No, there are not. Uh, seeing as there are none, uh, we'll move on to item number nine, approval of the agenda and consent agenda. Uh, are there any uh, requests for modifications of the agenda or consent agenda? Uh, there are, are no changes. I will just mention uh, we have a recognition of our retirees. Mm -hmm. uh, I will read their resolutions uh, during the superintendent report. Okay. Uh, is there a motion to adopt uh, the agenda and consent agenda as presented? So moved. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. All opposed? Yeah, I have it. Um, let's see. And then we're on to item number uh, 10, and I believe that is uh, uh, the trustee report. Is that correct? Yes, that is correct. Sorry. The navigate. I forget where we are in the lineup. I believe it's uh, David. Are you? Did you speak first last time, or you? Jackie did last time. Jackie did. Jackie spoke first off last time. Spoke first last time. Jackie spoke. Oh, it was April's turn. Okay, so back to Sam. All right. Well, last meeting of the year. It's exciting We're getting off to summer break. Um, it's been a, a, a long year. We made a lot of progress on many fronts. Um, the day after um, the last board meeting was the Kent Award Ceremony, and I just want to recognize that um, uh, BRSSD was a leader in awards at the Kent Ceremony, and many we had, had many awards to give out to many people, and congratulations to all the staff for all their hard work doing innovative programs that got them that award, and that is um, uh, promoting the, the best environment for our students here at BRSSD. So thank you for everyone for their hard work. And even those who didn't get awards, I know there's a lot of hard work going on, a lot of innovations. So thanks for everyone on the staff for doing a great job this year. Um, I also wanna congratulate all our eighth graders who we will miss, but we're very happy that they're moving on to bigger and better things. Uh, well, bigger things, maybe not better. <laughs> um, and I wish them the, the best success in the future, whatever their, wherever life may take them. Um, and I wanna wish everyone a very uh, happy summer vacation. Well, you were gonna talk about the two, but no. Can we do it? I didn't take good notes on that. No. Oh, 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 oh okay. <laughs> Sam was going to yes. talk about. It. Let's see, come on. Talk about yeah. Or something. I'm sorry, Mister. No, I took good notes, but yeah. I mean, it's, he he likes this. This is just um, uh, today. <laughs> Gave it up. We had our um, our two by two meeting. Um, let me pull up my notes. Sure you want. Yes, so our two by two by two meeting with uh, the city of Belmont and the city of Redwood City. We meet with city council members and other leaders in the um, um, of those two cities, and we talk about issues that affect the relationship between the school district and the cities. Um, uh, many different things came up. Uh, you know, we gave um, the uh, the cities um, an overview of our strategic plan, which we'll be talking about in, um, in agenda items. 
So we inform them of what's on the agenda tonight and where the district is going and all the hard work that everyone's put in on the task force and, and you know, a full um, amount of information to, uh, to come up and fine tune our strategic plan that we're gonna vote on later today. Um, we also talked about the um, by trustee area elections, which we had um, a first agenda item for today. Um, we told them about that. We got some great feedback because the um, both Redwood City and Belmont had gone through this process, Belmont more recently, um, but they had some advice on um, um, to give us on that. Uh, some of the advice they gave was to uh, make sure we over communicate, let all the community to know what's going on so they can provide their input. Um, we don't want to surprise anyone come to Uh, sp space that's being built. Um, of course, that's not going to affect the enrollment. It may affect traffic a little bit, but we'll keep in touch with the city and they're giving us information on a regular basis on how it's going. So we're very um, appreciative to hear those updates from them. Um, what else? Uh, the Parks and Rec Department told us about uh, field space being allocated um, and there's a lot more people that want field space and there's field space available, but um, the process went through recently and um, it was, uh, everyone was satisfied with with the, the sharing of field space that they got, so that's good. They also talked about the master plan um, for a, a public, uh, I think park space master development plan. Um, and uh, also talked about the uh, Barrett Community Center being um, something in development that, mm -hmm. um, that kind of paused during the pandemic, but it's picking up momentum again. They're doing surveys to the community. Um, and of course our kids, once they get out of school, there has always been a nice place for them to go after school and have a safe place to um, to stay. So with the Barrett Community Center building up, that'll give another, you know, a, a even better facility for our kids to go after school. And um, there's some other projects we talked about. We talked about SAM Trans and make sure that we're coordinating very well with them to make sure bus buses to bring kids to school um, and communication has been going very well with them as far as if bell schedules change or anything else making sure that the coordination is the best it can be and i don't want to talk all night um <laughs> but i think superintendent or i like my you have three minutes <laughs> <laughs> starting now <laughs> starting three minutes and then we'll meet again in the fall to discuss how things are going and yeah that's that's the notes I had here. Um, so I just I wanted to uh, just got back from a a very 
powerful and and I was privileged to be part of the cohort about 30 plus teacher staff and district leadership that went down to Los Angeles to um, to attend a, a, a workshop with the Museum of Tolerance. For those who don't know, the Museum of Tolerance, because um, I got educated as well, is the educational arm of the Simon Wiesenthal Center. And um, they're doing amazing work down there and have the amazing, they work with school groups and school districts on behalf, they get grant money um, to be able to work with school districts on not just things around the Holocaust, which a lot of their museums centered on, but also around diversity, inclusiveness, equity. And uh, it was very, very powerful. I'm still, as many of us who came on that, we're kind of reflecting and processing. But I would say that, and I've been to the Holocaust Museum, and I've also been to Yad Vashem in Israel. And it was very tough, some of this. It was very, a lot of it was very powerful, especially since, um, you know, growing up and being Jewish, you know, losing members to the Holocaust, losing a lot of my family, my grandparents uh, surviving the Holocaust and escaping when they did. It was very, um, very powerful. One, there was one uh, exhibit. What I liked was uh, outside of just the videotaping and some of the plaques, they did a very experiential thing. Um, one of the things that they did was you took a Jewish child and you followed their journey along the way, along different exhibits. Um, one other thing that was very powerful was you you were faced a, a, a choice, and the choice was like did like the Jewish um, people that were at the concentration camps, where one was able-bodied, you might be able, they said you could go to a working camp. The other one was going to the gas chamber, and that was children and sick, sickly, and pick one. Um, but interestingly, no matter which one you took, which path you took, right or left, it ended up in a mock gas chamber that was created by the museum. And so I really um, commend uh, and thank Assistant Superintendent Hugh for coming up with the curriculum. In addition to the Holocaust and the actual exhibit part, we've worked on cultural competency and proficiency, both as a district, what that looked like, but also kind of evaluating and doing work groups around what that means as an, at an individual level, on a school site level, at a district level. And I think also what was also powerful, there was, a two, was two speakers. One was a Holocaust survivor. There was a child at two, that was given up upon, almost upon birth, correct me if I'm wrong, um, and grew up in South Africa thinking that their father was really their father's brother. I mean, and then also they talked about the Mendez versus Westminster decision, which was around um, segregating, um, which helped desegregate um, in Orange County, Me Mexicans who were put into remedial schools. And so, and we also heard from a, a speaker, a survivor who was in the Japanese internment camp, also helped and be courageous to help it. So I think there was themes around kindness, compassion, courageousness, and action. And I'll just conclude with, it's very tied in with a lot of Jewish concepts. There is a term that was reminded to me called chesed, which is the Jewish concept of loving and kindness. And that includes courage and imagination. And one of those is just the theme of standing up and facing injustice. It's just one Jewish value. But I think as we try to encourage our students to find their voice and understand their identity and, and embrace the diversity of our district, I really look forward to working with the district leadership as they do works on their individual sites to, as a school board is how we can support that process and really further our collective understanding and as well as our own individual understanding. And so I really, again, I think I'm glad to be a part of it and I would really encourage, hopefully this um, partnership will continue, but hopefully uh, encourage those who didn't have an opportunity to go down these last couple of years to really um, take advantage and please feel free to reach out to me. I'm happy to share more detail. No. Um, I, I don't. I don't. I don't have that much. I've been. Uh, yeah, I've, I've. I've been. I'm excited about this last meet and and summer and, <laughs> and next month. I mean, the uh, uh, next school year. I think the idea of uh, my personally my first full school year as a, as a school board member and what it looks like to to be at the beginning um and what that's like for for 
my kids and the teachers in the schools and um and um how I can impact that. So I plan to spend some time kind of deciding what that looks like. Uh I did go to school for speeding this month. And um that was a kind of nice refresher. Like I uh okay, yeah, I started with the PTAs and got to rub elbows with some people that I had kind of forgotten about, to be completely honest. And um not that I forgot about school force, but I, I hadn't thought about like the, the impact they have and the work they do and um kind of how hard it is sometimes to find volunteers and 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 uh and to say these people who've been doing it for years. Uh wanna give a shout out to Carissa who is stepping down as president and mm-hmm. I think trying her best <laughs> to to give school force some space without her and they're probably not gonna let her go. Um <laughs> and I respect that. <laughs> uh but yeah, school force is obviously been doing some great stuff and it was it was cool to hang out with them and um and uh and they know how to party so <laughs> you hate school force uh i've also been spending some time with uh with my kids are at nesbitt and their ptas and helping do some recruiting from the same time of just remembering how hard it is to find mm-hmm. volunteers i want to appreciate all of the schools that i know have had some some changes in their pta boards and and uh just anyway if you're here or if you're listening to those people who stood, decided to step up as presidents vice presidents and council reps and parliamentarians and whatever all these words mean um i want to appreciate that uh happy pride month just want to say that it's a thing it's a um it's important i've been working a lot of that personally at work um in both the pride and joy that is that existence and uh and sometimes the troubles that are part of it too um, specifically about mental health uh i had the opportunity to go to the to the, the young and see the kahindi wiley exhibit it's a gay mm-hmm. black man um and everyone should do that at some point if it, while it's there uh, it was fantastic and also the sf gay men's choir um performed at a local school and um had some really powerful messaging and did some really great work getting to know the students through surveys and the faculty and so beyond performing they really just gaze and talk about Kind of actually what was happening at the school and how that may be related to them and it was a very kind of powerful exchange and um yeah it's just uh it's a it's an important month that gets truncated by being the end of school and mostly focus on that but i want to celebrate all of the things that is june and also the excitement that will be august and the rest <laughs> and the rest that is there in the middle hoping everyone just enjoys a ton of it well done um Hard to follow those acts. <laughs> so uh, I want to take my time to uh, express my gratitude. Um, I want to express my gratitude to um, so many people in this district that uh, go above and beyond every day, and it's just part of who they are and their their ethos and their character. Um, I want to thank all our teachers. Um, they work incredibly hard. Um, there's, they don't get paid enough. Um, the state of California doesn't let us pay them enough. Um, and I wish we could do better by them uh, anytime uh, we enter into these, um, do amazing work uh, with the resources that they have and make our lives better, our children's lives better. Um, it's just, uh, you see the growth every year and um, you have these discussions with people that just, they, it's their passion. It's clear, uh, and you can see the end results. And we're lucky to have them. Um, I want to express my gratitude to our cabinet. Uh, we have an exceptional cabinet. Uh, I am amazed by the work that uh, uh, CBO Bao does. Uh, she is able to clarify a complicated um, process or question or issue uh, just about better than anybody I've ever worked with. Um, I'd like to thank uh, Julie. Um, I think her HR practices are, again, exceptional. Um, I always feel clear about process, and I feel like there's a fairness to her approach that um, is fair. Uh, I'd like to thank Ching Pei. Um, she is so doggedly mindful about pursuing best practices in a, in a way that is reflected in meaningful results. Um, it's easy to be an initiativist, to jump from here to there, but it's really hard to collect meaningful data that then allows us to make real decisions about what's best practice and how, do we, how are we actually doing. 
Um, it's really impressive. Um, Ms. Sevilla? Oh, <laughs> Don't think we have forgotten about you because um, your efforts and the district's efforts around mental health and wellness, our kids need it. And uh, this is probably the time they've needed it most. And the fact that that synergy came along at the same time, um, kudos to uh, people that had the vision that that might be an issue and kudos to you for executing that vision. Um, we really do benefit by your presence. And um, Paulina, I see you too. Mm -hmm. I appreciate you. And I think that um, uh, I love that you are um, spending time getting the lay of the land, understanding our issues and working towards uh, a better product for our, some of our most vulnerable learners and their families, et cetera. Um, our site leaders, unbelievable. Kirsten, keep us on track, that's for sure. Jerome, you're back there behind the curtain somewhere. Thank you, too. Okay. Um, and I'm sure there's people that I'm leaving out, but one person I'm not going to leave out is the person sitting next to me. Um, Dan, um, uh, as our superintendent, joined us at a time of crisis. We were just talking about this today. His, this is his third year in the district. And for the first two years, we spent in complete crisis mode. It was either tearing down our schools and trying to build them back up again, um, worrying about the um, health and welfare of not only our students, but our staff and our family members. Um, one, one issue after another for two years, yet at the same time, when you look at our districts and how the children have uh, continued to perform, very little drop off testament to our families, but also a testament to the spirit of our, our district and um, uh, the educators and the leadership that we have uh, to help uh, continue us to focus, continue to have us focus on kids, kids, kids. How do we do better by them? Um, we voted today to, uh, for a vote of satisfactory performance for Dan. Dan it's a very silly, formal thing that we have to do. Uh, to allow him to continue his relationship with the district. It's a technical piece that we go through. But if you'll allow me, I would actually like to read the summative comments on your performance for this year. Um, <laughs> the board is very satisfied with the performance and steady efforts of, to build systems around educational quality, wellness, and safety, um, effective and open communication, to maintain the district's fin financial health uh, partnership um, a development and fostering reciprocal accountability. Accountability. We thank and laud the tremendous work, uh, amount of work and progress the district has made this academic year under the leadership of Superintendent DeGuara, in particular with regards to transitioning school environments back towards pre-pandemic settings and atmosphere, settling and revamping uh, components of the MOU, MOU with PTAs and school force with regarding fundraising and the ECC, developing and finalizing the strategic plan that will last us several years. Um, building ongoing trust and relationships with our bargaining units um, and uh, beginning the work on by district elections, um, a need that evolved over the academic year that was not part of the original superintendent goals, uh, which demonstrated his flexibility, adaptability, vision, and leadership to move this project forward. Continue with the development of our K through eight sites while also reinvigorating the culture and practices of our larger middle school site. Um, continue to build a collaborative and supportive culture between um, and for our site leadership. Uh, site leadership, a hiring and support has continued to be impressive. It is not lost on this board that five of our six current site leaders have been hired under this superintendent's leadership, with that number soon to be six out of seven. The board has provided minor feedback, which we won't get into. Um, and we look forward to continue to support your ongoing vision and leadership. Formally, we recognize that uh, Superintendent DeGuara has done a satisfactory job. Way to go. Um, but uh, informally, he has done a superlative job. Dan, thank you very much. Thank you.
That's all I got to say. Top that. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you uh, for the kind words. And I will just say it, it truly does take a team, a governance team, an amazing uh, team of support and uh, all the amazing employees in our district uh, coming together. Um, I'll just leave it at that. It, it definitely takes a team. Um, tonight, for my reflection, uh, I just want to piggyback on a couple of things uh, that were already said. Um, the Museum of Tolerance on Monday and Tuesday, um, I was pleased to join about, I think there was about 35 of us down there um, that continued our work, um, it, which is embedded in our strategic plan, right, about um, uh, building uh, climate and culture. Um, and, and encouraging a sense of belonging for all. Um, the question that kept resonating uh, throughout the two days for me, uh, as we talked about hol the Holocaust, as we talked about um, uh, Japanese being placed in internment camps, as we look at uh, the wars of today, um, was how was this allowed to happen? Mm -hmm. uh, and it talked about the enablers, um, the people who were actually doing uh, the harm, but it also talked about those um, bystanders who uh, really let it all happen. Uh, so really kind of that call to action is how do we support um, and making sure that we're doing everything we can uh, to support all of our students um, across the board. I want to give kudos to Ching Pei. It's not easy to uh, uh, manage and, and organize a trip of 35 diverse uh, individuals with different um, needs. So uh, thank you, Jing Bei, for making that happen uh, year two. Uh, and we have committed to, to making this uh, so long as the Museum of Tolerance is willing to host um, a yearly occurrence. So um, the lot, second reflection um, is the two by two, which was two by two by two today, which was today. I won't go into the detail um, of, of what we talked about. Uh, Sammy did a really nice job. Um, I will just say um, to be seated at the same table uh, with the elected officials uh, from both um, cities willing to talk about the things that we can do uh, to make our community better um, is, is really pretty amazing. So uh, just shout outs to both uh, Redwood City and Belmont uh, for their support there. And uh, the final thing I get the pleasure of doing um, is reading a couple of, of resolutions tonight. Uh, the first one I'm going to read is for Lisa as a party. Come on up, Lisa. Okay. <laughs> you get to come all the way up. Come on, right? <laughs> right in the middle. <laughs> um, I'll read. Uh, it, it gives me a, a great pleasure to, uh, to read the resolution. Uh, commending uh, Lisa Azapardi in her retirement. Uh, whereas Lisa Azapardi has announced her retirement from the Beaumont Redwood Shores School District, whereas Lisa spent a majority of her career at the career with Belmont Redwood Shores School District at Central Elementary as a reading second and third grade teacher, uh, whereas Lisa spent 38 years as an educator in the Bay Area, uh, leaving a lasting imprint on hundreds and hundreds of students and their families. Whereas Lisa is a fierce advocate for teachers' rights as a leader in BRSFA, whereas Lisa passionately collaborated, mentored, and befriended her colleagues, uh, whereas Lisa always had has a has had um, a comedic story, uh, whereas Lisa made her mark in education as a one of a kind uh, leader and be it further resolved that the Belmont Redwood Shores School District Board of Trustees hereby commends Lisa Azapardi with 29 years of dedicated service to the students, staff, and community of the district and wishes her a well-deserved, rewarding, and fulfilling retirement. Congratulations. Thank you very much. I will share uh, three years ago, um, I think Lisa was the first uh, uh, BRSSD teacher that I met. Um, and uh, b believe it or not, it was uh, the time of, of negotiating and, and, <laughs> and her being a fierce uh, leader in BRSFA. Um, but uh, I got to know her as really a kind, compassionate person um, who um, really has everybody's best interest in mind. Um, she did tell me that day, I made the connection with her initially because we're both Maltese. Hmm. And she said, if I like you, 
I'm going to invite you to the Maltese gathering during the holiday. <laughs> so I'm I'm still waiting to see. You gave us a right. Yeah. <laughs> uh, but anyway, and and there's that there's that comedic story, right? Um, but truly, um, I've always enjoyed um, connecting with you. Uh, when I visit Central, I always stop by your room uh, because I love the things that you're doing for kids. Um, you've had an amazing career. Uh, we um, work to live, not live to work. So I hope you enjoy um, your retirement. Thank you. Congratulations. I'm already on the um, to do the uh, Halloween parade. Yeah, excellent. Central. Excellent. <laughs> excellent. <laughs> <laughs> Feel free to, to share any words. Hi. Did you want to... Oh, I was just going to add a few words. If Absolutely. It, and then I'll let you go. I'll let you have the last word. Um, yeah, I just wanted to say congratulations. <laughs> I have a very special relationship with Ms. Azaparty. Um, uh, my first interaction, of course, was back to school night when she said, I'm going to welcome your kids in. And of mm -hmm. course, my daughter was in her class. So I have a special relationship there. And also I volunteered in her classroom. I got to hand out all the scholastic book things and help out, you know, with, with a bunch of stuff. Um, and I really appreciate all the work, all the work that you've done um, at Central for my daughter, for all the kids and all the many, many kids. I, I probably thousands of kids that have gone through your classrooms over the years. So thank you for everything. And it's, it's been a pleasure and I wish you the best of luck in your retirement. Thank you. I remember our field trip together. That's right. <laughs> mm -hmm. And your dad thought oh. it was the first time I had been in it. <laughs> I remember it was really muddy, but I felt really bad for your car. Uh, we went to- um, Is it San Jose one? The this one in Woodside. Um, the dentist. Uh, no, the other farm. Anyway, it was the uh, the Adobe Adobe. Hidden Valley. Oh, Hidden Valley. Okay. Yeah. I remember like I'm riding with you, Sam, because you have a Tesla. I've never yeah. been in one. <laughs> always enjoy the field trips and always enjoy the interaction with the kids. Yeah. Thank you. It's been it's been an amazing ride. Um, I've enjoyed almost every day. No, um, it's uh, bittersweet. I've been packing up my room, so it's mm -hmm. been kind of an emotional thing too doing it. I've been doing it for so long that that hat is now as of tomorrow hopefully when everything's done that I am no longer in that role and so it's um it's happiness and it's sadness kind of so thank you very much for recognizing me thank you Sam all right uh, and uh, the second resolution I'd like to read tonight uh, is for Tony Strickland, uh, who's not able to join us, unfortunately, uh, but I'd like to read the resolution uh, nonetheless. Uh, whereas Tony Strickland has announced her retirement from the Belmont Redwood Shore School District, whereas Tony spent her career with Belmont Redwood Shore School District at Fox Elementary as a transitional kindergarten, kindergarten and first grade teacher. Whereas Tony has been a dedicated educator who brings fun and joy to her classroom every day. Whereas Tony is an amazing team player who is always thinking about ways to make Fox the best it can be for students, staff, and community. Whereas Tony is a wonderful gardener. Whereas Tony is a very generous person. Whereas Tony is a loving and supportive grandmother and be it further resolved that the Belmont Redwood Shore School District Board of Trustees hereby commends Tony Strickland with nine years of dedicated service to the student staff and community of the district and wishes her a well-deserved, rewarding, and fulfilling uh, retirement. Uh, congratulations, Tony. Okay, uh, the next act, uh, item is number 12, and it's an action item, the uh, 23 24 budget adoption. That is uh, nothing quite as heartwarming as honoring <laughs> our wonderful teachers. Um, uh, 23 24 proposed budget. Um, so, last board meeting, we had a public hearing around the budget. Top line here is uh, no changes really. Um, to it. So um, as a reminder of where we are in the process, we are in June, um, which is, you know, the time that both we are adopting our budget and the state will be adopting their budget. 
Um, after the state adopts their budget, they will release an omnibus trailer bill with a lot of the implementation specifics. Some of that may impact our plans, um, which is why the budget, as I always say, is the living documents. Um, so budget outlook, overall, we have a statewide estimated deficit of $31.5 billion. Um, uh, our forecasted three-year decrease uh, in education funding is about $3.8 billion. Um, that said, uh, the governor and the legislature are very aligned in protecting um, education programs as a part of that. Um, and so despite that decrease, um, they are proposing a fully funded COLA um, and an equity multiplier and um, decreasing in terms of some of the one-time uh, grants that they have allocated. Um, and so uh, as far as we have heard, this seems to be agreed upon um, in, in terms of we're not planning, we're not anticipating seeing a large decrease um, in our rev, uh, revenue, um, though, of course, being on the cusp means we're relatively insulated, even if they were to put a large decrease on that. Um, still no additional details on Prop 28, um, everyone's favorite topic. So uh, we expect that language to come across in the trailer bill. Uh, key assumptions in the 23-24 budget. Um, so as far as salaries, uh, which of course is the majority of our budget, we don't have a COLA built in as we are still in negotiations. Um, and as for the rest of it, so benefits, books and supplies, services, um, largely we are following the dartboard on benefits, books and supplies. Uh, there were a couple of multi-year contracts in previous years, so we see a slight decrease there. Um, but not yet finalized is the Prop 28 expenditures, um, as well as costs of ELOP um, and SPED contractors. Uh, budget snapshot, again, top line is that we're forecasting a balanced budget for next year. Um, I think once we do figure out the unknowns and the things that are not yet finalized from the previous slide, uh, we'll see that go into some deficit spending. Um, which, you know, it was always to be expected, again, because of the way that one-time funding over the last few years have netted out. Um, and then in terms of other funds, uh, cafeteria fund, um, you know, uh, that, as we have always mentioned, is a program that uh, is still a net decrease overall year on year because it doesn't cover operating costs. Um, fund 21, so that is the issuance of our bond. Right now, there are... Uh, no expenses forecasted um, on the agenda later today. Uh, tonight will be up for approval our design build contract to go into that. So at first interim, we'll have a revised budget there for Fund 21. Um, and then our other two facilities fund, Fund 25 and 35, um, some projected expenses there for uh, our beloved Ralston Sinkhole. Um, and other than that, not a ton of facilities. Um, so... That is the summary of our budget. And again, no major changes um, from what was presented at the public hearing at the last meeting. Any questions? All right. Nope. Okay. Uh, I don't have any questions, and I'm seeing them as there are none. Um, uh, this is up for action. Um, so, all in favor? Hi. Motion for. Oh, wait. I guess <laughs> that thing, yeah. I move the Board of Trustees approve the Belmont River Shore School District 2023-2024 budget as presented. I, I second it. <laughs> no, okay. second it. No, no. All in favor. Aye. 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 Opposed. Okay, so the ayes have it. Everyone's ready for so much. Uh, <laughs> punchy at the end of the year. Okay, the next one is in, uh, item number 13. This is my Ms. Hu. Uh, this is uh, also an action item, uh, LCAP adoption. Hi, everyone. Great. It's going to be fast tonight. I didn't make these slides. Uh, hmm. Bottom line, between last month and tonight, we did have our feedback session from the County Office of Education where they read line by line, dollar for dollar, decimal point for decimal point, and between their feedback session and today, I have updated. So you have, we have a handout for the kind of typos that we found that are fixed. Um, those should have been emailed to you by Ms. Ellinger earlier today. So you have, because it's 129 pages. Uh -huh. um, the packet is here for anybody who wants. And we also have the updated budget overview for parents. That's part of the LCAP adoption. Um, we got full approval. All of the required elements are in our LCAP. And I, Putting it in front of you, there have been no substantive changes, no additional actions, no edits, no additional feedback from the community. I monitor our feedback um, forms between last month and today. It's ready for approval. So 
questions. Thank you for all your work on putting. No, thanks, that's the Enormous. Thank you job. <laughs> I'll just ask you a quick question um, on the budget overview for parents. Uh, there's uh, the expenditures for high need students in the 22-23 school year, mm -hmm. uh, showing at 44 million. Just want to verify that number. That is our entire budget. That is not our supplemental dollars. Our supplemental dollars is the 1.9 million. Great. Thank you. Any more questions or comments? Remind the board that this is an item that is up for action. We need a motion to move forward. I move that the Board of Trustees approve the local control accountability plan as presented. A second. <laughs> All right. All in favor? Aye. 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 All opposed? Ayes have it. The motion passes. Who was uh, not spending our money? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> the next item is also me. It is our annual presentation of our dashboard local indicators. This is um, where we annually reflect. You may remember the dashboard is a little bit strange. There are components in the California State Dashboard that are auto-populated based off of our state test results and our um, English language progress indicators, some kind of uh, sub objective measures. And then there's a subjective piece where as a local school district, we review several of the various conditions. We are, as you have in your packet, we as a team have gone through and done um, self-evaluation for all the local aspects. And so our conditions are met and we basically share with you at a public board meeting that we have met all the basic conditions, the academic standards, the parent engagement um, review and school climate and uh, broad access, broad access to course of study. Okay, any questions or comments for Ms. Hu? Thank you. My favorite two items of the year, <laughs> always fast. Uh, that was an information item only, so no motion is needed. We're well, uh, on to number 15, uh, SEL adoption. And I am gonna invite Chris, <laughs> I'm gonna invite Kristen to come up and share with you tonight. We do have- You'll some... notice that I said Ms. Zavita. <laughs> Like that same. Me. Here's Kristen in person, and I told you that it's from court, but I get stopped. Um, we are, do have Kristen with us. She is going to talk you through the SEL adoption, the social emotional learning curriculum. We do have slides for this and my next item. Before I let her go, I just want to say a huge thank you. She had led not only the EL piece in her Ed Services hat of Ed Services coordinator, but as our wellness coordinator, she does everything from counselors to staff well-being to student well-being to curriculum as you will see as she talks you through our SEL curriculum adoption too. So nice place to be tonight. Thank you. All right. Um, so first of all, just thank you to cabinet, to the board. Um, we're at this point with an adoption because it's a priority. Um, social emotional learning has become a priority in this district. And it's why I get to have a lot of fun at my job because I have the wrong way um, to do the work. So thank you to everybody for, for giving me the license to do this. Um, so really it's the goal of the pilot committee is to find the right curriculum. It's been quite some time since we um, embarked on looking at SEL curriculum. It's been at least seven years, a lot has changed. Um, besides COVID, um, but the big thing is that social emotional learning very quickly has become a district priority. So looking at um, the process, we started really with the SEL Academy uh, and that core group of educators really helped um, me in understanding where the need was. And so we went through and created our pilot committee and we started with making sure that we had um, background knowledge, a common understanding of what we were looking at when we were talking about social emotional learning, really focusing in on the uh, CASEL's five core competencies with the support of TeachWell, which you've heard me talk about our partnership with TeachWell um, at an earlier board meeting. They really helped uh, us as a group understand what we were looking at and what we were looking for when we listened to the presentations from three different SEL publishers. That was Second Step, uh, Character Strong, and Wayfinder. 
Uh, they narrowed it down, the committee narrowed it down to Wayfinder and Second Step. Something I forgot to mention is our pilot committee was representative of every grade level in every school across the district. Um, a great group who was very, very clear on wanting to pick the right curriculum to meet not only the needs of the students, but also to um, ensure that our teachers who are in varying different um, levels of expertise with social emotional learning felt like they had a part place where they could pick up the curriculum and get going. So that was really um, our focus. They piloted each curriculum for three weeks. Um, every day they did something from that curriculum, whether it was an explicit lesson or one of the um, SEL activities, and they provided feedback um, before they moved on to the next curriculum. And there was a training from the publisher before they embarked on the pilot to make sure that they knew how to, to access the, um, the curriculum. Um, middle school, when we came back together, when I looked at the feedback, middle school, it was very, very clear right away that Wayfinder um, met the needs of, um, sorry, I'm going very quickly through this, but that Wayfinder met the needs of our middle school students. Um, it was something that they felt was super engaging to the students and that they felt um, was a great entry point into really making social emotional learning kind of that fabric of their classroom culture. When we got to elementary, there was, it wasn't as straightforward um, as far as which of the two curriculums. This is where we had our most robust discussion. And what they really honed in on was that second step really met the needs of our TK through second graders. It was very developmentally appropriate for them. And starting in third grade was where we saw that Wayfinder was a better fit for our students. And um, the pilot committee came to uh, agreement and their recommendation is that we adopt second step digital for our TK um, through second grades and that we adopt Wayfinder for our third grade or through eighth grades. And uh, once we, we embark on, on implementation, we will not just stop at one training and say, here, ha here you go, but there, we're in the process of really thinking about all the robust ways in which we can provide um, support, whether it be through the publishers, through the counselors, through me, uh, that we make sure that this is a sustained effort um, and that we we look at this as a beginning to strengthening our social emotional learning practices. So, any questions? So, where was the um, like? What was the difference between that? Like you said, that second step at that third grade level. Like, what what did Wayfinder? How did it tip? Yeah, or what did Wayfinder have as part of that that curriculum that maybe the ex excelled in for the older mm -hmm. children than second step did? So when you look at the two curriculums, Wayfinder started as a high school curriculum and has developed down the grade levels. And they, they even say like our our primary curriculum is is an area we really need to improve upon. So when you get to third grade, something that Wayfinder has that um, our elementary teachers really liked is I should have brought one, but they have these journals. Mm -hmm. And there's, I mean, even just touching them, there's something about them that feels special and that the kids in the pilot classrooms really engaged in that journal in the work that they did in the pilot. And um, one of the teachers was saying like the her students really like it was like their diary and it was something very sacred. And she saw them having the opportunity to really express themselves. And these were kids who maybe didn't feel as comfortable in having their participation be all verbal in front of everybody, but it was a way for them to engage in the topic. But it was something kind of sacred between them and the teacher. And so they really saw that the kids in third grade, it, they they just kind of gelled to that. Mm -hmm. um, second step has always been a very strong um, elementary curriculum, even in the, they even have a preschool curriculum 
and they have the TK, um, the kinder through second. Mm -hmm. And their components are just, they're very developmentally appropriate for kids of that age where um, the pilot teachers felt that with Wayfinder, there was a lot of pre-teaching they had to do to even get to the SEL curriculum, whereas second step was very, I don't want to say plug and play, but you could pick it up and it was appropriate for where the kids were at. So they have these brain breaks, they have their explicit lessons. So that was where really where it, um, where the discussion fell is, was the de developmental appropriateness of the two. Great. Yeah. Any other questions? I don't have so much. A, I I don't have so much a question, but a comment. Yeah. The um, what I'm really excited about is that we have a, a adopted an SEL curriculum, so that we have a common set of expectations and a common common language around dealing with these kinds of issues. And I'm also excited to see how the uh, curriculum will be integrated within the um, core academic curriculum mm -hmm. and how that will affect perhaps overall outcomes and also how you know we track our student wellness over the next few years as we adopt the curriculum and the, the impact yeah yeah that it uh, has yeah yeah and you know uh it'll be um i wait with bated breath to hear about the um, education plan for our um, staff mm -hmm. and how we'll um, be able to best optimize uh adoption you know not just by the board but by our culture as a district. Yeah, can you add that? Um, I bet it was a helpful lead in for my question, maybe. Um, so as as this curriculum, I think the same thing, assuming it's kind of becomes the life of the district or, or in schools, uh, how do admin, or I guess not faculty engage with it? So like the language that it might say about behavior and even what's going on. So, you know, kids in trouble, PBIS, they come in here like, oh, you're going, this is a thing we talked about that. Like will administrators be engaging with Wayfinder or second step as well and know the language? Yeah, both of them. Um, so both of them are rooted in Castle's five core competencies, and um, both of them offer support for our site administrators and even for district leadership also. So there's a lot of different ways in which we can utilize that. Um, Wayfinder um, has the opportunity to host, um, you know how we have like math night and science night, like an SEL family night. I'm sure you're familiar with that. Um, and so, you know, that was part of the discussion about like having two different SELs at the elementary level. How will that impact how the site administrators can, can have that be part of the fabric, but they're both rooted in Castle. And I think it's okay that there's maybe a little bit different language in TK through second than there would be for third through fifth, because at the end of the, at the core of it, they're all working on awareness. They're all working on identity and problem solving skills. And that's where the, the counselors really can come in and support the work, um, the overarching work of, of the schools too, is because they're, they're part of our systems. And so the work that they'll do is um, from a systemic point where they can really help hone in on what the overall school need is using our data, our SEL screeners, what they're seeing, um, you know, from the Swiss data, from PBIS. So there's a lot of different ways that we can. Okay. Um, on slide nine, yeah. this, this is, I'm bringing in a question from April. Mm -hmm. okay. yes, she sent to me, she's, she's watching you. Um, I don't know which one is slide nine. Uh, it's the, the uh, elementary one. data. How does it break out between? <laughs> oh, that one. Yeah. Exactly. Sorry. So, uh, yeah. How steep was the difference between TK through two uh, contributors to this to this survey and three through five? I don't remember off the top of my head, but I do know that when I was looking at the data as it was coming in. The TK through second grade teachers had a much more defined viewpoint mm -hmm. as far as what was the better curriculum. Um, and so I don't know off the top of my head how big of a difference it was, but it was enough where, you know, 
they were very clear that it was not developmentally appropriate. It could be fair to say, like, like I look at these numbers and they're all similar, but they're probably not actually as similar if you took, say, three to five. No, because they're like, uh, you know, from the standards over, it was on a scale of one to three. Yeah. So a 2.33 versus a 2.63 is there. It doesn't look like a lot, it's an eight, yeah. but it is. And there was more, I believe there was more third through fifth grade teachers, like a few more than there was. TK through second. Gotcha. Um, I have two more. Sorry. Okay. Um, are, is it is it resource heavy? Like, um, I, I don't know the elementary version or third grade version, but like Wayfinder has like a digital mm -hmm. aspect. Yeah. We have enough digital things. Oh yeah. 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 And to be honest with you, I think that the internet is saturated with SEL materials and um, some really good, some look good. And then you actually like pick them up and you're like, this is nowhere near good. So I think what's so important about picking the right curriculum is that's where we want the teachers to go to first. Mm -hmm. And both of them have a robust digital library. Both of them have the capability to search for exactly what it is you're looking for. Um, both of them have the capability to edit the explicit lessons mm -hmm. to meet the needs of the class and the time frame. Um, you know, some have they have the short or the long. Do you only have three minutes to do SEL today? Well, here's mm -hmm. here's what you can pick from. So they were both very similar in that. So um, that wasn't up for discussion of who had better resources. It was um, more about whose whose resources were more developmentally appropriate for the grade level. Yeah. Um, and again, I, I I think they all have um like there's a data part to using it, right? Like you gain data from your students, mm -hmm. Is that right? Yeah, they have they'll have like pre and post, mm -hmm. and I know with Wayfinder starting in middle school, they have something called Waypoints, as you know, yep. um, that they're they continually improve upon that, where the teachers can, I think almost weekly they can have them take Waypoints. If you want to, still... yeah, if you want to, and to get a sense of what the kids need that week. Yep. Um, Will that interact? Or maybe even replace Youth Truth or be something like that. No. Okay. No, Youth Truth is so much more robust. Yep. Yeah. This would be more, I would look at this as like a teacher's formative assessment yep. to figure out where to go that week, or do we just follow, you know, the scope and sequences laid out by the publisher? Thank you. Okay. So this is an act item for you guys to approve our adoption and purchase. <laughs> I am I the language. Mr. Koss? Sure. <laughs> um, how do we start about it? There we go. I, I move to uh, recommend the Board of Trustees adopt the SEL adoption as presented. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Yes. All opposed? Motion passes. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, item number 16, world language adoption. This is also an action item. All right. So this is up for action as well. We have um, some curriculum that are that's out to date, out of date. Since I've been here, I've done so many curriculum adoptions. We've done social studies, we've done science, we've done middle school PLA. Now we are doing world language. I know everyone's the hot button is when are we doing math? Math is not available at the state level yet. We will do it as soon as we but for world language adoption, we offer Spanish and French in the school district. Um, I want to give you kind of a sense of the timeline of when we started this work. This conversation has been going for quite a while. Oops, I'm sorry for that random comma after preview. But in this school year, we started with the program preview. We worked really hard to look through the framework. The framework was actually adopted in 2020. Um, and then textbooks were made available in 2021. We broached the conversation in spring of 2021. As you can imagine, people were not feeling it. <laughs> uh, so we pushed it back a little. And then in our framework debrief and paper screen of the materials that are available to us, our Spanish teachers found that there was a good option that's on the state board approved list. Our French team found that the one item that felt like it was aligned to the new framework and wasn't just an old textbook that had new framework slapped on it, right? Similar to, do we actually have Common Core aligned materials or does it just say Common Core across the top? The French program that the teacher wanted to evaluate that was built for the framework 
is one, not on the state board approved list because it's not finished yet, and two, wasn't fully completed. So we do have the option of bringing that forward to you. We're going to work on that next year. We're waiting for the full completion of the programs. We can actually do an apples to apples comparison. Um, my Spanish team highlighted the materials that they selected. Then we debriefed and sent out surveys to teacher. I mean, the teachers did the surveys alongside the students who engaged in the pilot did surveys. And then I sent it out to the broader community for parent feedback as well. Um, I specifically opted not to keep it to just Ralston families, which caused a little bit of confusion. Some people were saying, does everybody do Spanish? And I had to clarify, no, this is just our middle school program. At some point, you might have a middle school child who might want to do a world language. So I want you to be able to give feedback on it. So that's kind of what we did. Um, the three programs that we looked at are K Chevere, Senderos, and Recoteros. Um, the first two are the K Chevere is the same publisher as our current our old program. Senderos um, is Vista Higher Learning and is currently used at Nesbitt in their program. So both of these are from really established publishing houses. As you can imagine, when the teachers reviewed, they felt like it was just more of the same. New title, new cover, but didn't address the framework, which really in, in the 2020 World Language Framework is about cultural proficiency in addition to language, it's about the usability of language. How many of us remember being in high school and learning all of the grammatical tenses? And I, I don't know about you, but I passed my AP test with a five and I'm not sure that I'm fluent in French anymore. Um, there is a really strong focus on communication cultures and connections based in the UDL framework. So thinking about that, thinking about presenting to students in a way that gives them ownership of their learning was really important that our teachers find something that was written for the new framework. And that's exactly what Repeteros was done. It's written by CLET, which is a newer publishing house. These are a collection of the students' comments. Um, they liked the program. They found it fun. They liked the photos. They thought it was funny. They thought that things were worded well and they could understand what was going on. Mm -hmm. um, the, the adult comments are, are equally positive. Um, they felt like there was a better platform. I think one of the key pieces is Spanish is spoken in something like 26 countries around the world. And oftentimes in textbooks, all you see are Mexico and Spain. And CLET is really conscientious about representing all of the Spanish speaking cultures. Um, so there's different photos, there's different conversations. There's here's this word spoken in this community versus that community versus the other, and they're all Spanish. Um, so it's important to teach kids that it's not one way or the highway, which goes along with all of the other stuff we're teaching. Um, one of the, this last one I like, it's the, the parent specifically where I am a native speaker. The pronunciation in this textbook is clear and correct. So, I mean, I think that's important, right? Like, I'm not a Spanish speaker. I'm not a native speaker. I'm not going to be able to evaluate. But to have the accuracy reflected and kind of validated by numerous native speakers, I think is good. Mm. So, ultimately, we are going to deal with French later. The recommendation from our team is that we adopt Repeteros as our district's Spanish language program for our seventh and eighth graders at Nesbitt and Ralston. And if we expand world languages to other, but for now, those grade levels at those sites. Questions? Right. So <clears throat> Spanish is, to, is going to be not sixth grade, uh, even in the IB program. It's not going to be at sixth grade. In the IB program, there will be a sixth grade. We are evaluating that. It is not a formal adoption because we need to find something that is IB aligned. Um, we have a new teacher that is hired. We do have a product from Plet that is designed for K-5 um, that our both Katie Hunter and the new hire Spanish teacher have been evaluating. We are probably going to purchase some of that to try out as a year-long pilot so that it feeds into Repeteros, uh, but it's not its own separate thing. Couldn't you use Repeteros for this, for the starting out at six, six grade? No. Um, so the, the piece is, I mean, I, I guess maybe I shouldn't say no so quickly. The, the language setup is still the same. 1A is for the first half of the year, which in a typical middle school, you teach 1A in seventh grade and 1B in eighth grade so that they're ready for Spanish to come ninth grade. 
the books are separated in that manner. If we wanted to, we could say you start 1A in sixth grade and you don't get through the whole thing, but that takes a different scope and sequence and doesn't allow our kids who move in and out of district okay. to be able to enter appropriately at the next site. So it is standard practice to do 1A in seventh grade, 1B in eighth grade. So we do have a supplemental that we are looking at for sixth grade. And we will we'll deal with that kind of on a one-off. It's not a district-wide purchase, we're a district-wide program. So that can be a site-based supplemental. So I, I appreciate being part of the community, being able to do the community feedback. Um, I really liked it. You know, um, as you know, I, I, I tutor students um, in high school for Spanish and middle school and on a lot of different platforms. And I, I really think this is a great one. It really embraces, and I echo the comments around it being a world language, not just uh, from Spain or anything like that. Um, the two things that I noticed that I just wanted to bring up, and, and again, it's been vetted by your, by your Spanish teachers, I understand that, but in terms of the number of units, it seemed, and again, maybe I'm used to it being a core class in some districts where you're, it's a Monday through Friday. Yeah. It seemed a little like light, like, like only like six or seven units in the 1A and in the 1B. Do you feel, did the Spanish teachers that piloted this, did they feel like that was enough material? Did they feel like they needed to supplement that? It seemed like a little like it was going to. Yeah, I think overall they felt like it was enough material. They felt like there was a little bit of pre-work that they need to do, their, like their early lessons that they would do independently before launching into the textbook. Okay. One of the pieces that they liked about it, it is lighter in terms of um, the number of lessons and the number of worksheets because it's heavier in projects. Yes, I love getting it. getting kids to talk and do right. So anytime you have hands on learning like that, you may as well not put as much in. I mean, one of the things we talk about when we do the other kind of core curriculum content is don't think that just because we adopt, let's say, Twig, that all of these beautiful lessons are going to get taught because there's way more than you have time to get through. I think this is a program that is chunked appropriately so that kids get a solid understanding um, and really do develop their, their oral language and communication skills. Yeah, I really, so I really love that aspect of it, the conversation. I think that's, and I like the project base. There was a lot of great projects, innovative projects. The last kind of question I had was just around it, the one that was set out for like community feedback in terms of the quizzes, you know, the performance kind of assessments. Is that still in the beta te testing? Because it seemed like we have noticed there there was a lot of errors. There's <laughs> Katie Hunter and Dolly both noticed there are so it's a newer, it is a newer program. Um, this is something that whenever whenever there are newer programs, I actually I really like it. You, we, we get develop really close relationships with our sales folks. Um, they want our feedback. So our teachers have sent back the feedback of the errors. And that's kind of the nice thing about everything being digital now. You don't buy a book that sits on your shelf for. 10, 12, 15 years, that's wrong. If there's an error, it's fixed by next month. So the next time you come to the lesson, it's completely fixed. Yeah. Okay. So there are there, there's some glitchiness to it that they they were finding that we've provided feedback on that they're already working with. Great. Thank you. What other IB programs do? So you talked about the 1A, 1B, typically six or seven and eight. Uh, how do other IB programs tackle that? I have limited knowledge on what many other IBs do. I have personal knowledge of some IBs in the area. They are language immersion to start with, and IB second. So their teachers are have prime have you know hold credentials and are our primary language teachers from their what we would call a target language. So it's a little bit different. They do the IB content in. The target language. They're not teaching the target language the way we're teaching Spanish. Mm -hmm. um, so that is part of the work that our new Spanish teacher will be developing, looking at Flex um, Alba y Gael program in unison with creating the IB curriculum that is IB approved. Yeah. Uh, yeah. First of all, I just want to say I appreciate you and also Ms. Sevilla for for doing these pilot programs, taking the time and getting. You know, student feedback, community feedback, everything to make these decisions really, really powerful that, that we're doing that and not just, you know, you and a few people sitting together saying, here's one we need to go to. So I never want to make a decision alone. Mm -hmm. I mean, some of these things are the right, right way. They're also complaints. We're going to do it the right way because that's what matters. <laughs> um, so appreciate you giving the presentation and um, just wondering um, how many classrooms do we currently have teaching Spanish and also French and then going forward, 
are we expanding that or keeping it the same or so that's a good question as i went through thinking about what is our adoption going to be how many years do we buy materials for how many student licenses do we buy with declining enrollment i i certainly factored that in when we did say study sync right we knew we were going to max out at 375 that's what our licenses are at um what we do in spanish right now we have six classes of 1A and six classes of 1B that are projected. I've been working with um, Sabrina on this one. And then Nesbitt will be all of the seventh and eighth grade, all of the six seventh and eighth graders. This program will be for seventh and eighth. Um, French at the moment, I wanna say has four or five sections, um, but they're not completely full. So we have purchased for the full 12 classes at Ralston. Um, it's pretty steady. It's a it's a pretty popular world language there. It's been consistent over the past few years, and we always have the option to purchase more as we need. Um, I, I like just like we do AS math based on student need and student ability. You know, kind of based off of our test data, we won't limit Spanish too. We only have 180 books. Sorry, you're out. <laughs> if we have 210 kids who want to take Spanish next year, and we have the staff for it. We'll, we'll purchase the books. So the licensing, is it on an annual basis or is it perpetual? We did a five-year contract that's attached to the um, board document uh, because you get a significant discount when you go longer. Um, I tried to pick a conservative number so that we don't end up paying for something we don't use. Mm -hmm. You can always add, you can't subtract. Yes. Is it three times a week? Is that the Spanish? Four times a week. Four times a week. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. I swear I'm listening, but I'm my questions are basic. Uh, we are approving the textbook that both Ralston and Nesbitt will yes. use, or just both Ralston and Nesbitt. They are using the same Spanish textbook. Currently, are using Senderos. They're currently using two separate textbooks. Okay. Um, and we, you know, when we ran it, we had the, you know. I've got Katie Hunter and, and Dolly, one from St. one from Ralston, one from Nesbitt. We set aside to find the textbook that made the most sense for their students. I let them know that if they ended up wanting to do two different things, given that there's a different focus in IEB than there is in maybe a traditional language class, we could do that. Yeah. They both settled in on Reporteros because it is written for the framework. It provides communication. It provides project-based learning. It provides a link to UDL. And it isn't just what we all remember you know, I took French, mon nouveau, on it. you've got a page full of vocabulary and then you learn your grammar that goes with it and you can read, Yeah. you know, you can, you can read Victor Hugo in French, but 30 years later, can I order food in a restaurant? Maybe. Um, <laughs> maybe a process question I don't understand. Yeah. If they were able to use two different textbooks, how necessary is what we're doing right now? What we're doing right now is a is, is really a formality of here is what we as a district are deciding together. Here is how we are using state funds to purchase state board approved textbooks. Um, and then back on like slide two, it says program preview and framework debrief. What is the difference in program and framework? What is the framework? Different, yeah. So what we did was we first had the publishers come and tell us about the various programs that are state board approved, just so we knew what the options were and what looked promising. Then before we actually compared the promising textbooks and, and did a paper screening, we spent time diving into the 400 page world language framework. We pulled apart the kind of key points, which led us to what is really important in the framework. This is the synopsis, right? It's, it's many chapters, but ultimately it's a change in how we teach world language. Mm -hmm. It is about being culturally relevant being culturally proficient and learning that it is, I mean, we don't say foreign language anymore for one, right? It's nomenclature, but it's important. Um, and using that same thing as you think about your French. Yes, well. absolutely. So then given this lens, then I gave the teachers a rubric yes. to do the paper screen. Yeah. And from the paper screen with the rubric, the scores were very clear. Yeah. Reporteros was the only one that was worth really looking at. So then I said, is that sufficient to you? Do you want to do a comparison, a side by side, or do you like, what do you want to do? So we went with one and we said, if we hated it and it was not what it promised to deliver from the paper screen, we would go back to the drawing board. When they used it with the students, they were convinced that it was indeed what the salesperson had promised and what the paper screen looked like it would be. Yeah. 
Any other questions and comments? Sorry, one more. With the French, since you're waiting, you're they they're they're waiting for the reporteros French edition. Yeah, that's correct. And do we, if they come out with it in the fall, I don't know what the timeline is, but does that mean we're waiting a kind of a full cycle to? Not necessarily. So okay. as soon as it's available, I mean, I, I'm, we're in touch with the sales rep already. Um, Christo and I have been talking about this as soon as it's ready and we have a full program to try, we will put it into the classroom to pilot okay. um, and see how it goes. It, it's one of these talk about formality. If we end up choosing to ask you to approve a program that is not on the state board approved list, then there's more documentation that comes along with it that says we've done our own due diligence that all of the standards are covered, all of the criteria are met. This is not state board approved, not because the state board, the, the IMAC group said, no, it's bad. It wasn't ready in time. Right. Sometimes that happens. Okay. Thank you. Any other questions or comments? Seeing as there are none, is there a motion on this action item? I move that the board approves class repertoire that's the district's middle school Spanish curriculum. I second it. El Segundo. <laughs> uh, all in favor? Aye. 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 Do we? Aye. Yeah. Aye. Aye. Do you know I do? <laughs> see. See. Yeah. See. Uh, the motion passes. We all say see. All right. Great. Thank you. Uh, number 17. <laughs> Uh, strategic plan adoption. This is also an action item presented by yes. Superintendent Deguara. All right. So, uh, Moviamentio Pasa. Not a word. Thanks, Ms. Ellinger. Uh, that was a brutal. So, I, I'll just start by um, I just want to take a moment to recognize uh, Lana and Gilbert, uh, who I believe are uh, listening to uh, tonight's meeting and hopefully tonight's approval. Uh, from YouTube this evening. If we can go to the next slide. I just want to remind the board of um, the process that we utilized, a really comprehensive process for the strategic plan that started um, back in July and August last year. Um, we made sure that we were um, thinking about um, BRSSD's long-term future, but also um, how we involve the community and all of our stakeholders in this work. Uh, we um, engaged uh, the community via three different surveys, um, survey A, B, and C, as we, we called them. Um, we um, worked uh, to, to go out and engage uh, the community in, in some public forums. Uh, we synthesized uh, what we heard, and then we did a lot of work in our task force. Um, our task force was uh, 30 or so individuals, which I'll um, highlight at the end here, um, who uh, came together to really make sense um, uh, for all the feedback and uh, really get us to the place that we are tonight. If we can go to the next uh, slide. Uh, last board meeting, we came to you with a draft of how things were looking. Uh, we took uh, board feedback and we made a few tweaks, uh, more uh, visual tweaks than content tweaks. Uh, some of those adjustments uh, included an updated layout uh, with you know, how we place uh, the idea of strategic plan framework and the timeline, uh, how we um, use the district branding um, in a more predominant way. Uh, we uh, uh, refined uh, some of the icons. Um, uh, we got a few laughs from the icons last time, as you'll recall. Uh, Well-grounded learners, we actually changed the icon uh, to be a light bulb and a star, uh, thinking about it more of, of a learning kind of big picture icon. Uh, we moved the uh, two high fives that felt a little bit more like community engagement to community engagement. Uh, and then we refined um, uh, some of the color schemes, uh, really pulling out the puzzle pieces, how they interconnect, um, and uh, deepening the gray um, uh, and, and switching a little color there. Um, kind of gray seemed to fit a little bit better with long term uh, rather than uh, the other three themselves. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, you'll remember the the uh, big framework is is four is an overview of four goals. Uh, with 12 um, key initiatives. Um, I uh, Let's go to the next slide and you can see them all there. Uh, to the left uh, is what we'll be approving this evening. Um, the four uh, goals 
uh, teach all students to be well-rounded learners. Uh, goal two, foster belonging and inclusion. Three, promote community engagement. And four, uh, invest, in our, invest in and secure our long-term uh, future. Uh, followed by the uh, three um, uh, supports, the three um, um, initiatives under each. Uh, we're approving tonight that one page um, with those those goals and and ideas behind them, as well as the um, uh, overall direction and vision, working together, uh, creating our future. Uh, next slide, please. Um, and then uh, next steps uh, before as soon as we we're done approving tonight, we're going to continue to uh, develop our uh, marketing collateral uh, that will look. Uh, like a flip book that we use that we have in our offices, uh, it will be a uh, that flip book will translate into a presentation deck uh, that I'll be able to use when I'm addressing PTAs, community groups, um, our staff in the fall, um, as well as whenever we need it from a district lens. And then um, finally, uh, you'll start to see um, annual goals and action plans. Uh, that is uh, the work that's in progress and. Uh, actually, I've, I've shared with the board um, drafts for that. Uh, that will be con continue to be developed over the summer, uh, but really hold us accountable uh, towards reaching our goals within the framework. And then finally, um, last slide, I just want to recognize um, all the folks as part of the task force. Um, I also want to just uh, rec recognize that we had um, hundreds of community members uh, participate in our forums and or in our surveys. And these folks on this slide uh, took the time to digest all of that, uh, find key key items, trends, uh, synthesize it uh, to come up uh, with what we have today. So uh, one last note, uh, I do want to recognize uh, Jacqueline Kraft, uh, who is responsible for all the graphics. Uh, she's making all of our amazing uh, goals and framework uh, look visually pleasing. Uh, so a uh, big kudos to her. And you, you will start to see that marketing collateral uh, come out over the next few weeks. Uh, and with that, um, I uh, just want to say that um, uh, this actually is not the end of our strategic plan. Uh, this is the beginning of our strategic plan, right? We, we uh, formulated our vision and our course moving forward. Um, now we have to make sure that we um, live it, that we work uh, to ensure that all the things that we set and the directions that we set, um, we, we get to. So uh, today, today is the start of that work. So with that, um, I would uh, like to recommend uh, approval of the strategic plan uh, framework. I make a motion to uh, for the resolution accepting. Well, God. Right. <laughs> stop. It's not in there. Ah. No. I make a motion to approve the strategic plan framework. There I go. That's Second. Okay. <laughs> Aye. All in favor. Aye. 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 All opposed. Uh, the ayes have it. The motion passes. The strategic <laughs> plan and framework is adapted. Yes. Are adopted. Uh, thank you very much for everybody who's worked on that. Thank, thank you very much, Dan. <laughs> and Lana and Gilbert. Thanks, man. <laughs> uh, moving on to item number 18. Yes. Another action item. You guys better get lubed up. All right. Uh, this is also presented by uh, Ms. Bao, our CBO. Uh, this is a public hearing. Oh, it's a public hearing. It's a public hearing. Uh, and resolution Proposition uh, 30 Education uh, Protection Plan. I open the public hearing at 7.50 p.m. All right. Uh, so the education, so uh, when we get funding from the state, it comes from a bunch of different sources, one of which is the education protection account. Um, it is legally required that the education funding from the education protection account must be spent on salaries and benefits. It's the state's way of guaranteeing some portion of their Funds are spent for teachers. Um, our allocation from that is uh, $768,000 or about 1.5% of our budget. Uh, we spend 85% of our budget on salaries and benefits. The purpose of this public hearing is for us to announce that we are using our EPA funds in accordance with the law and uh, hear from any members of the public who may be concerned that we are not spending our 1.5% allocation on salaries and benefits. Ms. Ellinger, do we have any uh, uh... 
request for comment from the public on this matter? No, we don't. Uh, seeing as there are none, I close the public hearing on this matter at 7.51 p.m. Is there any discussion or questions from the board? Okay, this is an action item. I move the board hold the public hearing to provide the public with the opportunity to review and comment on Prop 30 Educational Protection Account. <clears throat> account proposed expenditures for 2023-2024. And um, I move that the board approves resolution 22, approving sure. the Prop 30 educational protection account proposed expenditures for the 2023-2024 fiscal year, which will be incorporated into the district's adoption budget for 2023-2024. All in favor? Aye. 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 All opposed? Aye. Uh, the resolution passes. Okay, uh, this, let's see, we are up to public hearing number two here. Um, this is also an action item. It's a public hearing on a statement of reserves for 2024 budget. Uh, it is 7.53 PM. I open the uh, public hearing at that time. All right, also required is uh, public hearings whenever our reserves are in excess of the uh, state legal minimum, which is 3% um, of our operating budget. Um, and so what you see here is a statement of our reserves, which says that we are over budget, part of that, or sorry, not over budget, we are over the state required minimum, as most districts are. Um, part of that is due to the board policy of 6%, uh, which is above the 3%. Um, there is a component of that that is restricted and unspendable. And there is also um, the committed component, um, as well as an amount that is to fund our structural deficit. Um, since, as mentioned in the public present uh, in the budget presentation, um, with the use of one-time funds, it was always anticipated that we would have some surplus followed by some deficit spending, and that is why we have those in our reserves. So this is a public hearing and a recommended. Uh, a, Actually, I don't think there's an action. I think it's the public hearing is, is the right. action because you've already approved the budget. Oh. Wow. Oh, um, Ms. Ellinger, are there any requests for public comment on this item? No, there are not. <laughs> Seeing as there are none, uh, close the public hearing at 7.54 p.m. Um, any comments or questions from the board? Okay, so, uh, I don't. You, you said that we don't need to vote on this particular thing. That's okay. correct. Okay, so moving on to item twenty, we are knocking them off the list here. Motion, I'm ready. <laughs> motion that we have a motion. Motion to not motion. <laughs> okay, uh, this item number twenty is uh, project number twenty three oh one P transitional kinder classroom project contract award. This also is an action item. Yes, so as the board is aware, um, we have been planning to do uh, some construction work uh, to prepare for universal TK. Um, back earlier this year, we issued a RFQ followed by an RFP. Um, we are here to recommend that we award our RFP to Block Construction, who actually constructed this building that we are currently sitting in. Um, I think in their proposal, uh, they had a lot of creative solutions. Uh, we were impressed by some of their creative solutions, um, I think, partially informed by their deep knowledge of our buildings hmm. around how we can best retrofit um, our TK classrooms. Uh, their proposal comes in under budget, um, which allows us to um, take on some other maintenance uh, components as well uh, with our bond issuance. And so it is the staff's recommendation to award uh, project 2301P, Transitional Kindergarten, to uh, Block and Leonakis as our design-build entity. Any questions or comments from the board? Just a question on timeline. Is this a, is this anticipated to be through the summer only, or when is this work? No, so what we're going to be doing is we'll be working together over the summer on the formal design piece. So going into the RFP, we had what's called a criteria architect who does like really preliminary architectural plans, but for the full set of architectural plans that need to be developed and built on, there's a lot more work. So we're going to start on that design piece this summer mm -hmm. um, with the aim of doing the actual construction next summer. Okay. So it won't impact any? 
Correct. Um, yes. And and our mandate has very much been to say, you know, if there is any school year work involved, we will not move a class mid year. So if in the design process they say, oh, the construction will take five months instead of the three months, then that means that we need to plan around that, you know, whether that means having those students in a different classroom to begin with, things mm -hmm. like that. So we do not anticipate ever needing to move a classroom mid year. Thank you. Okay, this is an item of for action. Um, do I hear a motion? Move that the board awards the contract for project 23-01P Transitional Kindergarten Classroom Project to block construction as presented. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 The ayes have it. Thank you. I believe that passes. Uh, on to number 21. Oh my God. Oh, an action item. <laughs> it's uh, a service of action. <laughs> <laughs> We're just full of action today. Um, okay, so resolution number 22, declaring the utility of <laughs> building, uh, the bidding school. for automatic gate closures at seven school sites. Yes, uh, one of the needs that was uh, one of the pieces that we identified as um, construction or facilities work we wanted done was to install automatically closing hinges at um, on our gates. So we when I joined, so two summers ago, we installed gates around a lot of our campuses. Some of them just swing open, so we want to have a spring that closes it. In March, we issued, uh, so that is an amount, we got a rough quote, which indicated that we would need to publicly build that out because of how much it would cost. Um, we uh, originally posted a bid out, which included advertising in the newspaper, sending out to contractors that we know do this work on March 9th. Um, no bids were received. Uh, we then called many of these contractors and said, hey, any particular reason we didn't bid? Uh, one said, I'm so sorry, I literally just forgot the deadline. So we bid it out a second time. Um, and when you bid something out, not only is there, you know, we have to work with construction council and everything, and you have to advertise in the newspaper. So it costs, you know, several hundred dollars um, to do that each time. Um, we bid it out a second time. Uh, and during the second bid, we also received zero bids. Um, this time it was because of the way that we wrote it. There were a couple, um, it, it was essentially because we did not hire an architect to write the bid because it felt like it was pretty straightforward. So we didn't want to spend a few thousand dollars to write the bid and that there were a couple of gates that should have been written slightly differently had we had the technical expertise. Um, given that we have had no bids twice, um, this, uh, we worked with the contractor who uh, had expressed interest, but had expressed reservations because with the bid, they have no option to say, we will do it minus these two. We say, this is what you have to do and they have to do it completely. So they said, well, we don't want to bid on your entire package, but we would do it on this revised package. And so rather than just bidding and advertising and spending money for a third bid, um, we are recommending uh, that we that there is a declaration of the utility of competitive bidding having gone through two rounds of zero bids. Um, we have worked with the contractor um, to define a new scope um, that will allow us to install these gates. Um, and so we just recommend moving forward with the contract rather than going out for a third bid on scope. Uh, any questions or comments? Yeah. Um, yeah, I, I was just curious um, in hindsight um, when the gates were initially installed is the spring closure, is that something typically done or not? I'm just curious. It really varies. We actually do have them on some of our gates and not all of our gates. Um, I can't speak to what the design process was when we did the, the larger gate project. Uh, this is uh, some, probably an extraneous question, but what happened that that uh, entrance site uh, to Fox that's near Ralston uh, sort of pointing at that private property? Is, is there a gate there that closes or is that... Yeah. I always see that open in the morning. Um, Are you talking about the one all the way in the back of Fox? Yeah, 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 just right there by Ralston. So, um, you know, there's that one little pathway that goes up the hill to, to the end of the field. Yeah, I believe there is a gate. That, and also not all of our gates can have a spring. It really depends on the gate design. And so I think as the, the scope of this is for the gates that as it exists can just have a spring added to it, we'd like to add the spring. Um, this means that there are other gates that will not have a spring just because of the gate type, because having it be automatically closing would require actually replacing the entire gates. Uh, I see. Um, so that was not within the scope of this. 
Um, I don't remember off the hot top of my head what the design type of that gate is. Um, I do know that we did a walk around and we made sure that every gate that could just have a spring added is the scope of this. I think if we're thinking about replacing gates in general, that's probably something to identify via facilities master plan for a future bond issue. And I got it. Oh, thank you very much. Okay. That was a much better answer than I even expected. Um, okay. So any other questions or comments? Uh, this is an action item. Um, so we need a motion to move forward. I make a motion on uh, resolution number 23, declaring the futility of competitive bidding for automatic gate closures at seven school sites. Is there anything else? Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. All opposed? Motion passes. Wow. Okay. Number 22. My favorite agenda items. Future board agenda items. Uh, Yes. Uh, so just a couple things to note. Making schools out for summer, Dan. What are we doing? Yeah. Uh, a couple things to note. Uh, it is our uh, pattern uh, not to typically have a July meeting. Uh, so there will be no July uh, BRSSD board meeting. Um, our next meeting is August 17th. Uh, normal uh, things um, on the consent. Uh, regular agenda items we've tentatively um, schedule the tech update. It's a, a, been a bit since we've heard from Jerome. Um, he's doing some summer work, so an update there. We'll have just started school, so there will be a back-to-school update likely and my superintendent's update. Um, Ed Services, uh, Assistant Superintendent, who will talk about summer school, uh, student achievement, whatever we know from the spring testing. Um, and uh, there will be your favorite uh, policy updates for a first read <laughs> uh, coming up uh, in August. Uh, at our retreat, uh, likely topics will be governance uh, and some strategic plan follow-up, but definitely interested to hear um, items of interest uh, for both of those meetings uh, from the board. Um, and then finally, before I open it uh, for additions, um, I do want to note the schedule uh, that's attached. Um, we've made an update to the September 4th board, I'm sorry, September, uh, actually with uh, 20, it was the 20, 21st. 21st, thank you. I can add 14 and seven there, 21st. Mm -hmm. um, we've amended that date to go a week earlier uh, so that uh, CBO Bao can submit her financial reports as required by uh, the state uh, rather than add an additional meeting. We just decided to adjust that um, time frame. Um, and with that, if there's anything uh, the board would like to add or a conversation. You yeah. probably need to add on the regular agenda for um, August 17th, the uh, uh, redistricting conversation. I didn't see that in there. Oh, yes, thank you. Um, and then in terms of uh, board retreat, we've been talking about um, having Nicole uh, come back out yeah. um, and help us bring that project forward. That's necessary at that time or we want to consider it when we're going to do that this next year and just something to keep on our list great I would uh, defer to other members in terms of their interest there great uh, so uh just for for background uh trustee cost trustee bruno um uh, nicole anderson was the equity consultant that we worked with uh, to develop our equity statement uh, and do some background work with the district okay. He's from B-Town, one of my favorites. I love her so much. Um, okay, so um, any other comments or questions about that? Um, I see that on the consent agenda items for August 17th, the integrated pest management plan, could we have Talia come as a special speaker around snake handling? Wrangling? <laughs> 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 I'll make that request. <laughs> As a wealth of experience at this point. <laughs> All right, I'm sorry. Uh, uh, okay, so look, it is 8.05 p.m. Doing well. Uh, we're done with our, our meeting here, I think, right? Our open session. So uh, yeah. I think that we're at this point, it's... Uh, 8.05 p.m. We are ready to convene back to close. Uh, just a, a note, uh, no report out of closed. No report out of closed. Yeah, so we'll wrap it up. Wrap it up. Look at that.